I say one thing. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back. Um, our next speaker is going to be Boris, uh, excuse me, uh, Andre Boyardin from uh, Yandex. Um, he is a professor at the Ural University and a Postgres contributor. Yes, and he also hacks online when he's on YouTube and he's just going the code and he explains what he's doing. So if you want to learn internals, it's very nice to see him working online. And he also is open to have more contributions on the channel and then have more participation and then have a more like a hacky open activity. Yeah. And the theme of his talk is going to be about edge backup cases. In his talk, the hidden gems of Waldry backup tool. So please welcome uh, Andre. Hello. Uh, that was very nice. Uh, Presentation, thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Andrei, and uh, so you all are running Postgres. Do you do backups? Who is running? Who have backups? Uh, that's great, actually. In most non Postgres conferences, someone in the back uh, of a room, one or two arms, and that's it. So, do you check your backups? Do you have like validation? Cool, and you, are, you, uh, you also have monitoring of backups. So we have a very experienced and knowledgeable uh, audience. That's great. Uh, uh, my talk is about backup tool, and backup tool must be simple. That's very important for backup tool. But some uh, unusual features are there. They are there because we have some problems that needed to be solved. And uh, it's good that we have uh, this coherence with the <laughs> auditorium about unusual features, probably. You know, advantages of downsides of uh, pitch dump uh, and uh, you know what's point in time recovery uh, and we are going to talk in uh, de uh, more detail uh, about technologies. Uh, a few words about me, I am uh, maintaining a bunch of uh, open source uh, tools like backup tools, sharding tools, connection pullers. Uh, my first patch was committed to 9.7 and by the way i'm looking for someone to to give an interview on my youtube channel as was mentioned before uh, i was uh, hacking on postgres redshift green plum and some other useful databases and some less known i'm not alone uh, here's my team now we have certain engineers only three of them active on hackers but we are working on uh, having more uh, participation in community mailing lists. Uh, we are working not on only on Postgres, we are uh, hacking some for MySQL, some for Redis or Wolki, uh, some for MongoDB and other databases where we have source available uh, and preferably open source databases like Postgres. Uh, we started to, we started our uh, contributions a contribution team when we had uh, 1 million of requests per second to Postgres. Now we have uh, approximately 10 million requests per se each second to Postgres and we have about 11 terabytes of data under, uh, under the Postgres and uh, it's backed up every night. So uh, this backup tool is kind of working for 11, ter uh, 11 petabytes. Sorry. Uh, yeah, <laughs> few orders of magnitude. Uh, let's talk, so it's uh, 20, 25,000 of clusters. Some of them are small, some of them are big, and all that stuff. Uh, let's first briefly pass through usual features. Uh, normally, you want from a backup tool uh, point in time recovery, uh, so you want to have a backup and changes. And you want a very simple thing. You want them 
to be reliable. You want to be sure if something happens that uh, you can restore your data because you need restoration in some unusual circumstances when uh, user drop table or updated without qualifier or uh, something is broken and you need your data as fast as possible. So uh, you need reliable, fast restore and when you are uh, not having trouble when on a sunny day, you want it to be as efficient as possible. You don't want to know, you don't want to see CPU consumption and network consumption and all that stuff uh, by backup technology. Uh, when I'm saying that uh, we also need scalability, I mean that it should work on a very teeny uh, virtual machines with a fraction of CPU. But most importantly, uh, file system is not for backups. Like, you cannot store anything on a user's uh, block storage because uh, it's for operational data. It's not for making backups, preferably. Uh, well, you have some teeny cache of a uh, few bits uh, to enhance some operations, but they shouldn't be visible in a 10 gigabyte cluster or so. Uh, but at the same time, uh, this technology must be scalable on uh, hundreds uh, of terabytes in one cluster. and Preferably, you want uh, to have a backup at like each day, so backup ha have to complete in a day. <laughs> That's important. Uh, OLG is designed to be a disaster recovery tool in high availability setup. This means that you have a primary where you have uh, ch changes archiving, recently made changes to wall, and you have some uh, quorum of replications where, where uh, you are doing backups. Uh, some other databases need to shut off uh, one of replica to make a backup. We don't need it. Uh, I think none of uh, Postgres backup tools need to shut off replica, but I'm not exa entirely sure. Uh, when we are talking about resources, so we want to be efficient, uh, s uh, most crucial resource that comes to mind is storage space, but it's not crucial resource. Uh, actually, sp uh, storage is cheap these days. S3 is relatively cheap to SSDs in, in VMEs. Uh, spinning magnet disks are cheap. Uh, what you really don't want to spend is user's CPU and user's IOPS on, on a running workload. So your backup system should not create uh, resource starvation especially during uh, during some incidents uh, or that kind of stuff. Uh, it should prevent incidents, not create incidents. Uh, that's important part. And when we are talking about reliability, I'm mostly talking not just about uh, that this, the tool doesn't have bugs. The tool should try to uh, help user avoid bugs. So you, you don't have a command line uh, please create me an incident. You don't have a command line, drop all the backups uh, without confirmation and all that stuff. Uh, human factor is still m is a major source of incidents in our production. So uh, we try to build tools that are uh, like preventing incidents by their um, interface. But still, OLG is a command line tool. I'm, usually, I'm often asked to build some user interface, like web user interface, but I have none, because, mostly because I don't, I can't write a good, I can't create a good design, so perhaps we could have some UI. Uh, when we are talking about fast recovery, it's fa it, it may be fast recovery in various scenarios. Uh, so you might want uh, uh, analytical fast recovery, so get some stale data for for running long queries. Or it can be LTP recovery when we need to create a, a new uh, standby, uh, new standby node in a running cluster. Anyway, for, for usual features, it's unacceptable to have any data logs and have any data loss. That's quite easy. And I think most of backup tools that we have in the uh, community now meet this criteria. And we have a lot of very good backup tools. And funny thing is that maintainers of uh, many, um, almost all backup tools together are on the, uh, this conference. Here is uh, David uh, who maintains Backrest. Perhaps it's most popular as far as I know uh, backup tool. Uh, Barman is uh, 
I think it's oldest. It was there when I was uh, just considering taking part in a community. It was already there. It was working. Uh, but, well, I maintain another tool, which is called WallG. This is a successor of WallE, and it's doing all the same uh, point-in-time recovery as others. Uh, it's truly a community uh, tool because we have 170 contributors. If we uh, gather them together in this room, some of, this, some of them have to stand because there are, there are not enough chairs in this room for all WallG contributors. Uh, to be honest, many of them are university students that wanted a research project and all that stuff. Uh, but still, we have a lot of them. And uh, I'm not sure De uh, Daniel is here. He's, no, he's not. Uh, it's mostly uh, like... Uh, contribution of Daniel, who organized this big, this big community to have uh, a lot of different features. And some of them are truly interesting, and I'm going to talk about in, it in this talk. Uh, we have a relatively simple setup. Uh, so you specify storage, and we started with making the storage. Uh, of course, slides will be available at the website. I will upload everything there just after <laughs> finishing the talk. So you have to uh, have a storage, uh, and you have then a, um, you can check it with a backup list. From time to time, we are asked to have a comment that verifies credentials. So now the basic way to check that storage works is a list backup there. Uh, and after setting up a credential, you can run a backup push. It will complain that you don't have archive mode and uh, suggest you setting up uh, archive command. So you set up our hive command, and that's it. Now you have a fully, fully running uh, backup system. And uh, when you need to restore something, it will be a different story. But <laughs> try it before having to restore something. Uh, normally, you have a copy of your databases and changes in a wall. Uh, but in our case, we also have a, a delta copy or delta backups, uh, which are uh, combinations of pages that were changed through time. Why do we have it? Uh, it it's, it uh, uh, it's a redundancy, actually. It repeats the functionality of write-ahead log. But we have it to have a faster restore, because fast restore is a part of, like, of our goals, is one of the main of our goals after reliability. Uh, when you're applying a wall, it's applied in, t uh, in one startup process. It's single threaded. There is a parallel, uh, while, par par while apply parallelization patch in hackers, I'm not sure it will be committed in the next five years, but, but I hope so. Uh, anyway, uh, to apply changes fast, you need these delta backups. And uh, uh, if you have a Sunday backup, then you have a delta on Monday, on Tuesday, on, on Wednesday, and Thursday. And you are going to restore to, through noon. One third of the time, you will have to, uh, to fetch uh, base backup. One third of the time, you will apply deltas and one third for four days. And one third of the time, we'll be applying changes for 12 hours. So it's uh, a parallelization is a crucial feature of Delta copies. Uh, we use uh, LSN, the, um, our most reliable technology is LSN-based Delta copies that we uh, scan in pages uh, and uh, check their LSN to know if they change it and uh, uh, copy into backup only uh, pages that were changing between start of base backup and start of Delta backup. To enable this feature, you only have to change one number in WallG config, number of deltas that, he, that it's allowed to do after one backup. Usually, we, say, we set six deltas, uh, and it's already working. When you are fetching backup, you just say, I, I want a backup on Friday. And it will fetch you a backup, and it's totally hidden from you how uh, deltas are applied. OK, this was usual features. Now, unusual features. Uh, or at least I think that they are unusual uh, or somewhat unexpected, uh, but they are there. Uh, Postgres have a synchronous interface to archive changes. 
when when Postgres written next wall file of 16 megabytes or some 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 folks set it to 64 megabytes, uh, it, it's called you uh, archive command. When the standby needs uh, next 16 megabytes, it's called it's called an restore command. In both cases, WallG will try to parallelize it. If you are if Postgres have finished wall number 10, WallG will check if you have Wall, wall number 11, wall number 12, 13, 14, etc. We are trying to archive them in parallel. Uh, and uh, next time uh, Postgres is asking to archive uh, file 11, we will just, uh, if, if we have uh, enough prefetch archived, we will just answer, okay, it's already archived. Uh, actually, there are two modes of parallel archival. Uh, there is a mode uh, like aggressive mode when we keep track of what's archived in a Postgres archive status directory. We just change internals, uh, inter rename uh, wall file from ready to done on our own, and this is the most performance way to archive, most performant way to archive uh, walls. But uh, by default, we we prefer more safe feature uh, that is keeping track in separate directory what was archived and only returning exit code to inform Postgres that a file was actually archived when, when Postgres is asking to archive files that already is put into uh, storage. Uh, that's the default in, in every other features. By default, if you are building a wall G and running it, it will use not most aggressive technologies, but most safe technologies. That's a, again is a part of our three goals. Uh, but we have some more uh, aggressive technologies. Uh, like today, uh, Robert was talking about uh, wall summarization. We had wall summarization in 2019. So when we are doing wall archival, if you put uh, put this technology on, uh, we are also archiving delta files. So when walls are in a CPU cache, we also parse them and see what has changed. And when you need a backup from a standby, you download these delta files, but also you need some delta files from the left and from the right, from, from the past and from the future, uh, to parts that, were, that you have in delta files. So you parse some walls uh, in addition to delta files and do a backup. Uh, this technology is shown to be very fast, but we couldn't actually turn it on because we had some, uh, some reports of a corruption uh, because it's, it was difficult to build summarization of wall because some wall records change not only pages uh, that they denote in a record header, but Elsa changed some, something uh, indirectly. Luckily, this, uh, will be f uh, this problem is now a problem of Postgres Core 2 because we have wall summarization in core. And finally, we will be able to use this technology because uh, we will have a proper way to parse wall files and build these delta files. Uh, radical change. Uh, in, in radical difference in architecture with uh, vanilla Postgres uh, is, is that we have delta files for one gigabyte of wall. So the, the file describes many wall files at once, while uh, summarization is made for each uh, segment of wall. Um, uh, also, we have a strange technology which is called wall-based prefold. So when you have some login standby, and imagine that it's lagging like one or two days after primary, uh, and working set is radically different from what is accessed on primary. Uh, when when uh, Postgres asks for a next wall file, if we have a delta file, we are trying to prefetch pages from uh, on, from a file system to make sure when the uh, startup process approaches these pages, uh, it, it will get it from a page cache. So we try to make uh, um, Postgres uh, to, 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 to make yeah, I.O. in advance uh, before uh, pages are actually needed. 
this technology is also starting to appear in Postgres, uh, but uh, we have it based on uh, all deltas. Another feature that we have is a partial restore, and I think this is a feature that we got wrong. Uh, like in other tools, you can specify that you want to restore all the cluster except some tables. In our case, you specify which tables and which schemas and which databases you want. And that creates a problematic situation uh, that uh, first problem that we had that after having a vacuum full, you have changed all the rela relation file nodes and it's not easy to track in backup tool. But uh, there are still, we fixed this problem, but still uh, you can, for example, create a table, but do not avoid creating a uh, reference at foreign key table, and thus ha have inconsistencies when you create database only partially. And after you start database with this uh, partial restore, you can have entries in PG class that are not connected to real files on the file system. And that's kind of a mm, not very convenient feature, but some folks use it, so it's, it's there. If I would redo it again, I would just allow uh, having database as a whole or, or not having database as a whole, not giving these uh, tables and schema options uh, of a partial restore. Uh, we have a throttling. So you want a uh, backup that is not interfering with your normal uh, normal workload. And to do so, you can specify how many bytes a second pa is passing through your network interface and disk interface. Uh, but it's not always necessary. Uh, if you want to do a real uh, fast backup, you can just specify a turbo option that will disable all the throttling. Uh, in some cases, you, ha you need to do it. In, and uh, uh, even if you have config well configured limits in your config file, you can override it in with one common line uh, argument. And another interesting feature is that we can uh, leverage many disk queues. So normally, we read only uh, serially files, read file one by one, because you don't really need fast backups. Usually, unless Turbo is specified, then you have a high concurrency read from disk, and it, it actually affects Postgres heavily because Turbo backup uh, will consume all the resources available, and uh, its uh, like transaction per second capacity will be reduced severely. We have some consistency check, and the most important of them are timeline verification. Uh, for example, if you, for some reason, uh, restore a backup and forgot to uh, forgot to change uh, archive credentials, uh, running this timeline verification will notify you that there is an unknown timeline in your uh, in your archive that is being actively written to, and uh, you will know that you misconfigured some restored cluster. Theoretically, it's possible to to live uh, in the same archive storage uh, by many um, by many uh, clusters, but it's not recommended setup. Uh, currently, in Postgres, your timelines are sequential, but it's kind of a, if if I would engineer the system myself, I would um, give random numbers to timelines because they are not sequential. Uh, there is a risk condition when you're picking next timeline. Uh, also, we have a wall integrity check. Uh, it verifies that after failover, you have all the necessary partial files in a, a, a S3. Uh, it, is, it was somewhat flappy on uh, last archived files because they are archived in parallel. And if you have a wall named uh, X plus one, doesn't mean that you have well, X, if you are, if you are speaking about very last, uh, very recent files, so now it's protected from flops and uh, takes into account uh, uh, degree of parallelization of well archival. But essentially, if you miss some file, you will notice that it's not in the storage. 
We have checksum verification in line, uh, but it doesn't tell you much. That's why we don't have a common line uh, access to it. But if you look into uh, Sentinel, the file that denotes end of a backup, you, see, you can see that uh, some blocks may have checksum mismatches. Checksum mismatch is a normal thing to have. Uh, some of them are normal thing to have. But if you have a lot of checksum mismatches, that might be like a, a noisy but still a sign of something goes wrong. I don't know how to use this information so far. Uh, if you have more than uh, some limit of corrupted blocks, we just uh, set the number of corrupted blocks and do not write their actual block numbers. Uh, the features that I'm asked uh, frequently and it's not implemented yet, if you wish to write something in Go and want to contribute, uh, you can make a Prometheus integration and folks are asking for metrics like uh, time to archive wall and frequency of walls and uh, like compression ratios and all that sent to some metric systems that would be good to have it. Now you have to rely on listing backups uh, to get this metrics and it's not super convenient. But we, you can get uh, stats from machine readable JSON format uh, via command line interface. Uh, we have a reverse delta unpack, and we tried uh, to optimize it further. So norm normally, uh, previously, you was using a forward application. So you have base, then apply delta, then apply delta. Uh, recent versions applied uh, backwardly. So you ha if you have a latest version of a page, uh, you don't have to write it, it, it its previous versions. And... Uh, Usually, it takes much less time than forward application. So you see that reverse application is three times faster than uh, forward. Reverse restoration is three times faster than forward. Um, another interesting feature is a catch-up. Well, in Oracle, you have a manual that is called roll standby forward using Arman. And you have 12 steps to do to use our hive to make it uh, uh, to catch up. So if you have like months of a lag on your standby, this is useful. Uh, in WallG, you can start a uh, catch up send and catch up receive, uh, one on a primary and one on a replica, and it will apply, it will take backup, incremental backup, and apply it on top of uh, uh, lagging replicas. It helps you to catch up. You can do it many times. So. First one will take, say, one hour, and now you have an hour of a lag. Then you can apply it again, and it will give you 10 minutes of a lag. Call it uh, once more, and it will give you a minute of a lag. And that's, then you can start and try to catch the lag with a usual synchronous replication. Uh, still, there are some uh, f features that we want to have. We want to have a potency. Now it's not restartable, and if some network interruption happens in, in, during uh, catch-up, you have to start from the beginning. It's not very, very convenient. So if someone wants to participate in development, uh, we have a list of features. And most important is idempotence and uh, restartability of, uh, uh, of uh, catch-up. And also, besides we want a uh, fast restore, we don't have a parallelism in this technology, but it will be there soon. About change tracking, uh, there are different options. We had, at some point of time, P-Track. This was a patch discussed in Hackers. Uh, but P-Track is, uh, is not present in many distributors. So now we do not support P-Track anymore. It was fast, but it was corrupting data. We had to remove it. Since then, they fixed the corruption. So maybe now it's it's not corrupting data anymore, but we still <laughs> remember. <laughs> Perhaps at some point, we will ma make support of P-Track 2. Uh, it's a normal story for us. For example, we have a Z-standard library, Go, Go library, that was corrupting data. We removed it and changed to broadly. They fixed the corruption bug after two years. 
but we still didn't turn it on because we want two years more to pass, so be sure it <laughs> won't repeat again. Uh, by the way, by default, we use LZ4, that is most performant uh, compression, but in most workloads, broadly compression or Z standard compression would be better than LZ4. Uh, Wall Delta had an issue, uh, corruption issue. Now, uh, this, that, pro that kind of problems of parsing walls was sorted out in hackers, so perhaps we should try again. And wall delta is still off by default, and I think I don't think you have an option now to, to enable it, but we will bring this technology back. Uh, and normally we have to do a hip scan of a tables to know what pages were changed, and we cannot do uh, visibility maps and free space maps incrementation too. Uh, we take them as a whole files because uh, we had some problems seven years ago with them, and we still <laughs> still are <laughs> afraid to uh, do incrementation of uh, these files. We use uh, file system modification time as a marker. Uh, we don't use it to know when it was modified, but we know if it's changed the, and the science changed, probably the file is changed and need to be fully scanned. We have some technologies for sharded cluster. For example, green plum. Green plum is just many postgreses. This is a joke for for those who know green plum. It's of course not just many postgreses, but still, you have a many running uh, timelines, and this can be repeated in other systems like Citus, or you have a sharding on, based on uh, two-phase commit, and you still need uh, to coordinate some restore repo restore points in many timelines. And you can insert these points to make a consistent restore. If you had a transaction that spanned between clusters, you can restore it uh, at some point where there were no uh, distributed transactions in progress. We are working on some uh, features on storage. First of all, everyone wants a snapshot backup. Like many clouds and many file systems allows you to do a snapshot. Some of them claim to be atomic, but Mm, that doesn't matter actually. If you call PG start backup, do a snapshot and call PG stop backup and have a usual wall archive, uh, it would be enough independently of is it atomic or or it's not. So in future versions we will have a snapshot snapshot uh, backups supported uh, on a part of wall G. Also, we're trying to use server-side copy. For Greenplum, it's very useful uh, because uh, they have append-only files and we even use patch uh, uh, in patch uh, version, but for Postgres, it, uh, we are not very active users of server-side copy. Perhaps we could use it more. Also, one of the interesting features is uh, failover storages. So if you have a not super reliable storage, uh, it's kind of a risky because if archival stops, uh, you can find yourself in a situation when you don't have a disk quota. I heard that uh, there was some major incident with some car manufacturer previous sum uh, summer that uh, just uh, space, uh, there was no space left on uh, database uh, block storage and the, the database was down b because of that. To avoid such situation, you can configure some failover storage. Uh, if it's activated, it will s a little slow down uh, wall, or, uh, wall restoration, but it will save you from uh, having uh, outages because of not sufficient uh, disk quota. Uh, features that we would like to have. Well, we would like to have increment. Like, there is no reasons to have in backup indexes, visibility maps, full free space maps, and all that stuff. It should be rebuilt upon restore. But we don't have this ability because we are we are a go tool. We cannot link with uh, Postgres to rebuild these indexes and visibility maps. If we could link with Postgres binaries, we would call their routines to uh, restore. Actually, this data uh, may seem small, but in an incremental backup, visibility maps and free space maps are more than a half of uh, information that we store because they are not incremented. And we want to work on this. We either create a, um, 
technology to increment these uh, files or recreate them on registration. And the feature that we want most is the integration of backups with a vacuum. Like, vacuum is looking for data that had changed, and backup is looking for data that had changed. Ideally, you don't have to have these two different technologies uh, in in a very radical way, monitor it in a different way. And uh, uh, But that's just a wild idea. Maybe we can come up some uh, here with some uh, proper implementation of it, because I, still I cannot imagine an API for doing so. Uh, if you want to help a project, uh, or if you are looking for some reasons not to use Volgy, we have two main downsides. Uh, we don't have repositories because I just I, I was develop, working as a developer for ten years uh, as a Windows developer. I just don't know how to <laughs> how, how to do it properly. So if you know how to do a packaging of Go product, mm, uh, help it would be much appreciated. And our documentation is uh, not super descriptive because it was. Uh, incrementally maintained as our backups are, and uh, structure of our documentations, our documentation reflects history, how we developed it, but it doesn't reflect uh, user flow, how how the user should use it, and uh, perhaps you can feel that my English is well, not on that level that you need to clearly and easily explain how to use our tool. But we have a chat and uh, we answer issues on GitHub. Uh, we have a Telegram chat. Feel free to join and ask if you have some questions. And uh, thanks for listening. I will be happy to uh, answer your questions. Please use this tool and uh, I will be happy to implement some of your ideas. Thank you. Awesome. Andre, thank you so much for that talk, and let's open it up for some questions. Please. So for the partial restore, mm -hmm. you said you would not, if you had to do it again, you wouldn't do schema or table partial restore. Yes. You would only do database. Uh, it's funny, because like we support partial restore, but we only do database, and people have been asking for table which is very complicated. So the question is, why wouldn't you do it again? Because uh, you have uh, broken PG class entries. Okay. You can violate like in a uh, referential integrity, which is um, way, well, people expect it. Like, uh, okay. I mean, there's uh, some caveats here anyway. I also have uh, just, never mind. I'll tell you later. But I have a solution for your uh, checksum false positives. Oh, to the what? I have a sl the checksums. Uh -huh. You're getting the false positives or false negatives on the checksums. I have a solution for that. Uh, we are trying to reread, uh, just yeah. in case. Uh, we can talk about it later. We still have some. Uh, um, if the page is actively updated, you reread it again, reread it again, yeah. reread it again, and you have three times checksum uh, failures. We do it a little bit differently. We just basically, if the if the page is mutating, we mark it as okay, because it'll uh -huh. be in the wall. Right, or, or somebody is actively corrupting the database at that moment, in which case it's like, what do you do? But if we reread the page and we can see that it's changing, mm -hmm. it's either correct, right, the checksum matches, in which case you're good. But if we can see the page is actively being updated by Postgres, then mm -hmm. we just mark it as valid. Even if the checksum still doesn't match, we'll say, okay, this is a changing page, it's valid, move on. Sounds and that good. way you don't get those false negatives that are confusing to the user. And we found this to be extremely reliable, actually. It works pretty well, even though it's a little hokey. <laughs> well, thank you for the idea. So we, we, we come up on our own to reread, but we didn't know that the, the, the change is enough to, to mark it. Was it. Okay, thanks. Thank you so much. We got another question here. Yeah, do we have uh, hooks uh, for, for example, uh, run something when backup starts and run something when backup ends? Because, uh, for example, what I want to do, I want to ask from Amazon for more IOPS uh, for during this backup and uh, get uh, them IOPS back uh, after the backup completes. Uh, 
Is it possible to like uh, to add in configuration like uh, run some some command uh, uh, when backup starts, run some command when backup ends, uh, just uh, to tune uh, storage uh, during Sounds the backup? Sounds like a good idea. If please send a pull request and we will merge it. Uh, you can have uh, hooks for a shell command that executed at some point of time or a HTTP call or something like that. Let, let's do it. I think it's doable, but but uh -huh, I wouldn't use it myself because like, you don't want a fast backup. Uh, uh, unless you want, I, I see. <laughs> uh, so in, in some edge cases you want fast backup. This is super rare. Usually you want a very slow backup that is taken page by page and then all that stuff. You want fast restore. Yeah, but weekly backup usually should take less than a week to, to backup. In, uh, so if I do weekly full backup, it should take less than a week for, 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 for uh -huh. the backup, for the cold, uh, cold storage. Okay, if you take backup for a week, I think that you want a faster backup. Yeah. <laughs> makes makes sense. Uh, so please send pull requests. This sounds like absolutely useful functionality, so let's do it. More questions? And also let's add uh, similar hooks into restoration because if you have this uh, ability to tune uh, virtual machine for restoration, that would be good too. Thank you. All right. Uh, so it looks like I have two people who are responsible for different <laughs> backup products. So I will ask actually open question. So I accidentally found a very easy way to make any backup unusable. And I'm wondering whether anything can be done because obviously that was not the case. It was by product. Uh, and maybe not in the tools, but anyway. So we have uh, our B loved objects materialized views, uh, which we want to be implemented better. So what we found that if backup starts when I materialize view is in progress of refresh, and some of them takes pretty long to refresh, and it ends before this materialized view is done refreshing, this is completely like uh, you can throw this backup away because this materialized view cannot be uh, recreated because mm -hmm. it does not exist when you try to create it. It says that some parts of it, because some of the like types um, already exist, and if you try to drop it, or the type, it says you cannot drop it because it does not exist. Uh, so any um, ideas? <laughs> Yeah, what to do with this? I can propose several ideas. First, you can use refresh materialized view concurrently. You can create invalid materialized view and then run refresh on it. Yeah. It will. You will always have some version of restored, just one before or just one after. But I'm not entirely sure it will work. No. The things that will 100% work. You can create a restore point after any uh, materialized view creation, and never restore before this. Uh. Wait, say it again. Because again, uh, like I want to identify my role. I'm uh, the uh, I support databases. Everything else is done by our beloved users. So I have no control of how they create it. Uh -huh. uh, so otherwise, there will be no materialized view in any of 300 Postgres databases I support. But unfortunately, like they uh, do what they do. Uh, if you don't have control, you don't have responsibility. <laughs> I have responsibilities. I don't have control. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you push responsibilities to Postgres. <laughs> I cannot, I work in trading. I cannot send anything, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> I mean, I can try to reproduce it, but it's, it, it will be very challenging because, you know, it has to be long enough materialize you running. And <laughs> Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Be be beautiful. Like uh, I, Okay, I, beautiful. Beautiful. I, good good enough. Great answer. Good enough. Yeah. I, okay. I can see okay. that uh, we have have a top test for this. That's uh, if like if something is uh, hard to reproduce in production due to the fact that you have to have a long enough process. Uh, in a top test, you can have an injection point that makes Postgres slow at certain point. 
And when you have this top test reproduction, it's it, it will be fixity absolutely. If if it's not intended behavior, it will be sure fixed to the next miner. I think. How come they, are not walls? they won't be available on replica if, if they are not on walls? They are for sure in walls. Perhaps they are written at the end. So it's like a big tree is built. You build an unlocked index, and then you lock every page of, of, of the index. I think that's, uh, that's the case with the materialized views. But uh, well, let's. I think we don't need to start with um, with the reproduction. We should start with the description. I, I somewhat suspect this is, is it's intended behavior. If you create an unlocked table, you won't have it in backup. If you if you didn't log, if it's if it's time of first creation of materialized view and it was not created, you shouldn't have it because it wasn't. Really quick, I do want to interrupt. This is super exciting, but with the remaining five minutes, just to make sure that other audience members who might have a quick question uh, has the opportunity. And if no one raises, then we can jump back. Okay, jump back, <laughs> please. Uh, we think we're, we can. Mm -hmm. So if you have partial object, that's obviously a bug. Awesome. So thank you, everyone, uh, for the attendance, for the participation. Thank you, thank Andre, you. so much.